we're going to look at how to bridge the gap between the physical and the digital world. So we go into in immersive things. And uh, my guest here, our guest here, is uh, Patrick, and he goes as well with the nickname Pripe. Yeah. Um, he is currently doing a PhD on human-computer relations, interaction, actually. Interaction, yeah. That's an important difference, I would say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to discuss this since I'm as well uh, a little bit on this field. Uh, we made an agreement about that. But he's focusing on augmented reality today. Uh, he's doing this study in Dresden, I uh, understood. He has a general interest, of course, in things to do with 3D that goes along with these kind of things. Yeah. And his talk provides us an overview on AR in general and explain its possible uses uh, for good and for the bad. I would oh. say so. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Patrick. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Light the fuse and put it in play, Patrick. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so this is a foundation talk. Um, so it's mostly aimed at people um, who know nothing or very little about uh, augmented reality. So hopefully after the talk, you will know uh, a little bit more. Um, however, um, if you have some experience, um, I hope maybe you will get some new impulses. I don't know. Um, and furthermore, this talk is also um, focused more about how augmented reality can be used for uh, everyday life and not so much on the uh, scientific community. So, and it's roughly like 30 minutes or something like that, so I made it a little shorter so that we have, um, have some questions in the end. So if you have something that's of particular interest, just um, ask afterwards. So, but first let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, virtual reality because like, um, I think most people maybe are more familiar with the term. Um, there has been a lot of talk um, about virtual reality like changing, uh, revolutionizing the way uh, we use computers. There are as many commercial virtual reality headsets as ever before and also quite uh, a lot of applications. But uh, somehow VR doesn't really influence um, our everyday lives that much. And I think there's two reasons for that. The first one is that, um, that virtual reality um, applications are mostly centered on uh, entertainment right now. And the second is that it disconnects us um, pretty much from the real world. So while it might have the, the ability to, uh, to actually um, yeah, transfer us into another world, which more or less looks like this, um, at the same time, we are cut up from reality. And in contrast, augmented reality expands the real world. And um, in the mind of most people right now, this looks something like that. Um, but the important thing um, is that we can still perceive our surroundings. Um, and we can also experience the virtual content as well. And this particular difference um, makes AR a lot more useful for everyday use than virtual reality. So let's go to, to a little definition of what um, augmented reality actually means. So the important thing is that we combine real and virtual content, blurring the borders between both. So as you can see, here's a virtual globe on a real table. And the application also interacts in real time. So if I move or if I uh, have some input, uh, the application um, reacts on the spot. There's no delay. And the objects um, are situated not relative to the user, but in space. So if I move around, the globe stays on the table. So this is basically um, uh, what, what I, when, when I'm talking about augmented reality, what I mean. But uh, what it's um, also important uh, to know that AR is only part of the so-called mixed reality continuum, um, which ranges from reality without any augmentations, so the normal reality we experience every day, uh, to a completely virtual environment. Um, and those four categories are basically the, the classic um, mixed reality continuum. There's also some extensions to that, um, which you can see here. I don't want to go into any detail of what those all mean, but the important thing uh, to remember is that there is no hard border where augmented reality begins and where it ends. Um, there's also a lot of ways to provide augmented reality. Um, Mobile augmented reality like Pokemon Go, where the AR content is perceived through a mobile device like a smartphone, 
uh, is the most common form today. There's also projected augmented reality, where you have a projector superimpose an image onto a real environment, um, which is especially useful if you have like collaborative scenarios where the content um, should be perceived and manipulated by a group of people at the same time. You can actually see uh, this example uh, right out of the door. Um, there's a similar installation there. Um, and then there's uh, what this talk is also most, mostly focused about, head-mounted augmented reality, um, where users wear AR glasses, uh, which can be seen through, um, and where the uh, virtual content is projected onto. And this is the most immersive form of augmented reality. And when you have uh, sophisticated technology, it's more or less uh, indistinguishable from um, the real world. So that's, that's basically the goal where we want to get. So, but now is the question, OK, why, why augmented reality? What's so important? Why, why have this talk at all? Um, yeah, for that, I want to quote uh, Tim Sweeney, of uh, the CEO of Epic Games, because it's always a good idea to quote someone who's more um, famous than oneself. And he said that uh, he believes that augmented reality will be the biggest techno uh, technological revolution in our lifetime, because once you have an AR display, you don't need any other form of display. You just take your screen um, wherever you go. Um, so that's a very powerful thing to say. Um, he also thinks that the revolution will happen um, in the next 10 years, um, which is very optimistic from my perspective when you look at what the current technology can do. But nonetheless, I believe this revolution uh, is going to happen sooner or later, so it's useful to familiarize um, yourself with, with the term. Um, what is also important to note is that the goal is not to, to just substitute a real displays with virtual ones, but augmented physical objects themselves, that the augmentations really have a relation with the location they are situated in. So only then AR will have really the power to revolutionize our everyday lives. So I will, um, I will elaborate on that um, a little later on. But first a question like how likely are fundamental changes in our society triggered by augmented reality? So if we compare it with smartphones, um, and the way they are used, I think it's very likely. Because smartphones today are technology focused directly on supporting um, the way uh, people live their lives every day. So and it also started as a research long time ago, um, before commercial products were available, and now they are ubiquitous, and they are an integral part um, of people's life, and for some people it might be difficult to actually live without them. And I think when AR is is likely to do the same when it's focused on, on the, the things people actually need um, and once the technology comes along. But before we go there, a short, very short history um, of augmented reality so that you can see where this is all coming from. So actually, augmented reality is rather old. So the first um, augmented reality, virtual reality device um, was built by uh, Ivan Sutherland in 1968. It was called Sword of Thermocles. But it was already, uh, had already had tracking um, and see-through optics. So that's quite advanced for the time, I would say. Um, the actual term augmented reality was only coined uh, 25 years later by Caudel and Mitzel in 1992. So quite a, a long time uh, in between. But of course, the re research uh, stood not still um, during that period. Um, Here's an interesting example that I wanted to show you from 1994 by State et al, which shows an ultrasonic image of a human fetus directly superimposed over um, a woman's belly. And yeah, this shows that even in a very early on that people were thinking about how we can use augmented reality to really benefit humans in a lot of ways, despite the technology at that time being very limited. Um, this is also an important step because it was the first mobile AR headset um, for usage aus outside of the lab um, with the wonderful name Turing Machine uh, by Feiner et al. in 1997. Um, so even like early on, the question was, OK, how we, can we use this technology not only indoors, but well, how can we use it outdoors as well, which is very important. Um, and then finally, the first AR application using mobile devices, uh, in this case PDAs, for the people who still remember them, uh, with external uh, cameras. And 
You can see those little markers in the background which are tracked by the cameras and then uh, little virtual trains are um, overlaid over the wooden train tracks. So it's not really that practical, just to like a proof of concept more or less. So, but yeah, like I said, mobile AR uh, today is the most common form of augmented reality, but maybe, maybe that might change soon because now we have like the current the, the, the first generation of really um, commercially available augmented re uh, reality headsets um, and therefore also an increased interest um, in, from the scientific community but also from the industry uh, for solving their various problems. So this immediately brings us to the areas of application and hopefully how augmented reality um, may influence our lives in a positive way. Um, first a little bit uh, about the research. Uh, Actually, only 12.5% of the research is actually focused on application uh, cases for augmented reality. Based, uh, the statistics are based on uh, the International Symposium on Mixed and Augmented Reality. Um, and the rest is focused on things like tracking technology, interaction, rendering, and so on. Um, and of those application cases, uh, most of them are usually industry-centered and not so much on everyday life. So we have things like, for example, uh, logistics, we have um, things in the medical sectors, and of course they have um, a great indirect influence on our lives, we will still benefit from those things, but I want to focus a little bit more on, on everyday use, so how can we immediately benefit from augmented reality, and uh, explore that a little further. And that, that those are things like uh, guides and cultural heritage, for example, um, and telecommunication and telepresence. Um, which also brings us to the first uh, use case, which is uh, AR telepresence, uh, which is more or less like video phoning, only more, um, with uh, 3D avatars of the person you're speaking with uh, embedded directly into the environment. So basically like a virtual avatar sitting on the chair next to you, um, which is, I would say, rather cool, because it's um, something that, that's out of uh, sci-fi uh, sci novels or films, and, but now it's here. Yeah? Now we can use it, um, and despite being far from, from perfect, uh, it's still very incredible, um, at least from my perspective. And you can not only have um, a conversation in real size, but you can also like scale it up and down as much as you want. Like um, in the uh, lower right image, you can see that uh, the girl is uh, standing on the pedestal um, in front of, of the guy. Um, very small in size. You can actually like have people, um, virtual people, running around your table while you do other stuff while talking to them. Um, so another very classic example, um, I would say, is uh, AR navigation. This is um, a system by Google, which is a direct advancement over their um, smartphone navigation. And I think despite being an, an very obvious example um, of when you think what AR can do for you, um, it's also a very powerful one. So basically it means like when you want to go somewhere, you project like, for example, a line in front of uh, the people uh, that you have to follow to reach the destination. It's very easy um, and very understandable. Um, currently, um, there are mostly specialized systems that uh, focus on something like airport navigation or car navigation, for example. Very few for general uh, pedestrian use, but uh, I think that's likely going to change in the future. So the next one, also um, maybe a little obvious, um, finding places of interest based on selected preferences. So. Yeah, example would be like, where's the next post box, where's a good restaurant or bar? So this is of course possible today with smartphones as well. But the big difference is um, that you, you don't have any abstraction. So you don't have to match the map of what you're seeing. So where is this building that, that uh, it says on my smartphone? Uh, you get the information placed um, exactly at the point of interest itself. Um, so that makes it a lot of easier uh, and useful for example. And of course, you can also show something like user reviews um, or, for example, uh, the menu of the restaurant um, so that you can find a suitable match. What's also very, very useful uh, is something like uh, AR translation, um, where you like provide an instant translation of a foreign language in place. So, for example, you look at a sign in Russian and you get uh, the uh, content in English. Um, this is actually Google Translate, uh, uh, which maybe some people already have used. Um, yeah, but like you would 
when, when you have used it, you would say, oh, well, that's really practical, for example. And when you use it with a head-mounted device, it's even more practical because you don't actually have to like point the device somewhere. You just see the text and um, the language you prefer. So, but besides uh, translation, um, you can also offer context information as well, of course, because you can not only show in this example um, the direction, but you can also show the distance to, to the object. Um, and it's also suitable for places like museums, um, where space for text is usually very limited, um, but space in AR generally is not. Um, which brings us to, to the next application case, which is uh, cultural um, heritage and tourism. Um, and this is an, a nice paper um, that, that gives a good example of that, because uh, it, it can make history somewhat more experienceable. So when you have ruins, for example, of a Greek temple, like here, you can um, get an impression of what the temple might have looked like directly situated on the actual ruins. Um, or when you have the fields of antique uh, athlete, uh, running tracks, you can, may have a virtual athletes and augmented reality uh, that give you an impression how these facilities were actually loose, like the people running around doing sports and stuff like that. And I think this is really powerful. I think you, yeah, you just get to see what it, what, what it was looked like in the past. Um, but another important aspect, um, and I think a very powerful one, uh, is how AR may have, um, may, have technology, uh, may, may have the power to make technology more accessible again. So today's technology grows more complex and it's more and more connected. Um, so that's even for, for expert, it's sometimes hard to actually say, okay, what state is the system currently in? Uh, for a layman person, it's even harder. So AR can help make this, this hidden information visible again in a way that's easy to understand. So just to give you a, a little example, which is not perfect, but hopefully uh, sufficient to transport the idea. Um, imagine you have a simple router at home, for example. Uh, we have some status LEDs, but when, for whatever reason, your internet breaks down or stops working, they, they don't have you that much for, for debugging the actual problem. So to get more information, you have to most likely access a web interface if you still can remember the IP of your device. Of course, you can do what we have done here and, and put a little piece of paper with the IP on the device itself, but that's hardly a practical solution. Um, yeah, so imagine with augmented reality, you can just look at the router, do a simple gesture, and then get the information you were interested in directly superimposed on the physical device itself, So, which can help you immediately recognize what the problem might be. So maybe you just forgot to turn on DHCP or something like that. Um, but we can expand that concept to uh, not only include a router, but also the wireless devices connected to it. So one of the predominant features of wireless LAN is that there is no wire, so it's hard to see which devices are connected, where they are located, and what their IP is, and so on. Um, so where we are, we can simply draw virtual connections um, to make that information easily available to the user. So I do something like this. Um, but we can also use it to make errors more recognizable. Um, for example, one of the devices may be not be able to resolve websites because there is no DNS server registered. Um, and then we can, of course, also display additional information, like the bandwidth a device uses. And when we have an actual physical medium, uh, we could actually use that for displaying information, like a graph of uh, the bandwidth over time. And it's very easy to understand what is displayed, because it's directly located at the medium itself. Um, yeah, so I hope this, this example gives you an impression of how AR can, can really help uh, with understanding technology again. Um, we, might be, um, we might talk a little bit about that later on. Um, but first, let's come to some technical challenges. So how does that actually work and what has to change so that we can really use it every day? Uh, the first one is tracking, uh, which is one of the main challenges um, because I have to, to locate the user somehow. Um, I have to know where he or she is and where, what, what she's looking at, for example. Um, so for general positioning, I could use something like GPS, but precision is, of course, a problem, and I can't really use it indoors. So we need additional track not, uh, tracking technology. Um, and there are many different approaches, but the current state of the art is more or less infrared tracking with time of flight. So that means 
um, infrared light is emitted, um, which is reflected by the environment, and the time um, between sending and receiving the light impulse uh, determines the distance to, to an object. And with that, I can create a depth model of a room, which more or less uh, looks like this. Um, and then I can not only tell where the user is right now, uh, but also when he or she is moving around. And while this technology is, is far from perfect, I think the current um, tracking technology is, is quite robust and useful in that regard. Um, what's also important is uh, display and rendering. So there are many different technologies for head-mounted devices. Um, one of them is video see-through, where a camera films the environment, which is then, together with the virtual content, rendered um, onto a display um, in front of the user's eye. But latency is a very big problem in that regard, because you will very easily get sick. Um, another is see-through optics using polarized uh, glass, where the air content is projected onto. Um, and there are even small laser projectors, which uh, project directly into the user's eyes. But for some reason, uh, user acceptance is not very high. Um, but the ideal, uh, the ideal display would not require any external display at all, but you would directly manipulate the optic nerve, uh, which sends uh, uh, the messages to the brain. Well, we, we don't have that right now, so we have to make uh, through with what we have, and uh, this is basically see-through optics, which is right now um, like the current state of the art. So let's, let's uh, look at what the problems are uh, in that regard. Um, one of the, uh, the problems is opacity. Because uh, when I have um, a solid object, like a human, for example, um, no background should bleed um, through them. So currently, for, for, for the commercial headsets, this is not so bad. But yeah, it really depending on the lighting conditions, when you have a lot of sunlight, you can't really see anything anymore. But uh, yeah, there's still much room for improvement in that regard. What might be even more important is um, the field of view of the AR headset, because like a human has uh, roughly uh, 210 degrees field of view. Um, and as you can see here, like the Microsoft HoloLens has like 30 degrees, and the Meta 2 has like 90 degrees, most of which, from my experience at least, are pretty blurry. So yeah, that's not, there's still, there still has to get a lot better um, well, uh, until we can really use it. Um, also very important is uh, yeah, when a person wearing an HMD, um, what, what does she see? Like, uh, how, how can I recognize uh, what, she, what a person is looking at? Um, and how can I get data on, on the recognized objects? So due to performance requirements, most of the processing will most likely not happen um, on the head-mounted device, but it will very likely take the form of some web service or similar services, um, which not only process a constant visual input stream of the cameras of the HMD, but also have to, um, uh, have to provide uh, data sources for the various objects. For example, when I have touristic points of interest, I need to get some information on them. So this requires a constant data stream and a very good connectivity to make it really useful. Um, and it also requires a lot of services um, readily available to use um, by the AR device. So this is quite a big challenge, maybe the biggest of them all. So to give you a little impression how that all could work, based on uh, existing research, which is called uh, reality-based information retrieval. Um, so imagine you have an AR HMD that feeds a constant live image to a server to recognize objects um, the user is currently uh, looking at, for example, vegetables at a market. So the server is able to classify those images by comparing them with a couple of saved reference images uh, and gives uh, uh, or a, sense, uh, a list of recognized objects and the confidence value back to the HMD. And then uh, the HMD can query a different service um, to get some recommendations for meals uh, that I can cook with that vegetable. Um, so when I explore a market um, and you have your AR display with you, uh, you could not only like, um, it could not only tell you what a particular vegetable is, um, in case you might not know, but it could also um, tell you what to do with it, which more or less could be quite useful. Um, what's also important, um, like, if AR glasses are to become um, 
everyday objects. Ergonomics and aesthetics are going to be important. So you probably don't want to wear something like, um, like this right now. Um, so for the most part, that means shrinking um, the glasses down to the size of, of current normal glasses, which is a form factor that's more or less uh, already accepted within our society. Um, yeah, and as you can see uh, in the comparison, we are not really close um, to being at that point. Um, and uh, one of the most important questions is not only how to display the AR content, but also how to interact with the content. Because otherwise it's a very limited uh, experience. Um, so while AR objects might appear uh, to be part of our environment, we can't really touch them. So I, can, I, I can't actually press a virtual button. Um, and there is research concerned with providing haptics as well. For example, there is um, ultra haptics, which uh, uses ultrasound to create uh, resistance in mid-air, so that I have an actual resistance when I, when I touch somewhere, but it's still um, in a very early state. So currently, mostly gesture interfaces are used, um, where my fingers are tracked, uh, and the line of sight together with the um, hand gestures uh, are used to trigger interaction. Speech, speech input is also a common solution, but uh, use in public environments um, is limited. And another possibility um, is also to use additional devices like specialized controllers um, or, for example, the touch screen of a smartphone uh, for interacting with the virtual contact. Gaze tracking, that means tracking the user's eyes, um, will most likely also play an important role. But right now, um, there is pretty much no perfect solution, um, and also still a lot of research happens in this regard. So this is a very hot research topic right now. Um, so let's come to possible dangers and other issues. So all, all the things that might not be so great about ubiquitous augmented reality. Um, yeah, the first one, pretty obvious problem, uh, is information overload, where too much information leads to excessive cognitive load um, by users. So virtual content has to be used sparsely to best support the users. And the only way to make sure users are not overstrained is to leave them in control of what and how much is displayed. But users might not always have the means to control it. So especially when third-party services are involved, uh, we may see something like um, inversive advertisement, um, an invasive advertisement, sorry, uh, and other unwanted content. Um, and since head-mounted AR is already a personal experience, these ads are most likely to be personalized as well. So this directly leads to the question of privacy and data security. Um, there will most likely be a constant stream of the user's current position and a live video feed to various third-party services. So this raises the old question, how can I control what happens uh, with my data and who gets access to it? And privacy, of course, is also a big issue because there's hardly anything more personal than a constant live feed of what I'm seeing. So even if I myself decide to don't use an AR device, as long as everyone else does, it hardly makes a difference. Um, so at the center, maybe, is really the question of who controls the uh, actual hard and software platforms. So similar to smartphones, it's likely for a few global operating corporations to not only offer the AR devices, but also provide the corresponding software ecosystems as well. So we see that already with uh, the direction the HoloLens by Microsoft is taking. Um, yeah, but AR consists of even more sensitive data than current smartphones. So yeah, will we be in control of our own devices? Do the companies producing them have any interest to keep us in control? Because most likely their primary motivation is to make money. And will people even care? Because they hardly seem to care with smartphones right now. So I think this is an important question. And uh, another possible application area for augmented reality, which I uh, haven't talked about, uh, is military use. So head of Heads-up displays um, have been used in the military and aeroplanes, for example, for over a decade, and there also have been uh, several scientific papers evaluating the use of augmented reality in military use. Um, so it's not difficult to imagine AR systems 
like telling soldiers where to go and maybe even who's friend or foe. Um, Microsoft has recently made a contract with the US military for over 480 million US dollars to evaluate the use of the HoloLens um, on the battlefield. And uh, the goal is to um, increase lethality, uh, mobility, and situational awareness of soldiers on the battlefield. So um, I don't really want to provide any judgment on that, but it's best to not have any illusions um, what this technology can and eventually will be used for. And it's probably not all going to be unicorns and rainbows. So let's keep that in mind. Um, the another interesting aspect is how does massive use of augmented reality actually change how humans interact with each other. So for example, when we can project ourselves um, everywhere at any time, um, how important will it be to meet in person? So to give, an, to give you an impression, there's uh, the novel Naked Sun, written by Isaac Asimov in 1957, where it's common for people um, to communicate with photorealistic holograms um, and even being naked in front of each other is no problem, but it's extremely unpleasant for people to be in the same room with a real person. So I'm not going to say this is what is likely to happen, um, but I think it's an interesting aspect to think about, as there will be some social changes involved, which we don't know yet. Um, this also leads to the question, um, how our own way of thinking um, is influenced by the constant use of augmented reality. So, for example, how does our perception of locations and how locations are connected uh, change when we are guided by AR navigation, which in the worst case means following a line until we reach our destination. Um, there has been research uh, showing that extensive usage of GPS uh, might lead to an atrophy of the hippocampus, increasing the risks of cognitive, disease, cognitive diseases like Alzheimer later on in life. So it's important to be aware uh, that there might be issues and it's important to do the actual research to, to figure out what those uh, issues might be. And of course, maybe even the, the ultimate question, uh, what is reality? Like how does our understanding and perception of reality itself change when we use AR? Um, this is more a metaphysical question, um, but I think it's an interesting one nonetheless. It's not so much a problem for moderate use of augmented reality, for example, to, to annotate objects, but more a question for photorealistic augmented reality, which can alter the way the world looks to each person individually. So uh, if my world looks vastly different um, from your world, and when AR is always active, um, what does reality really mean in this regard? And what role, if any, um, does the unaugmented world um, play in the lives of people anymore? So this might be something to think about. Um, and with that, I, I conclude my talk. So hopefully I could show you that augmented reality uh, could have um, a benefit in our life, uh, but that there are also some risks involved. And I hope you found it somewhat interesting. And now we can have some questions. Thank you. Fantastic talk, uh, good overview of whatever is possible in here. Thanks. I see some people here queuing to uh, ask you some questions. Let's go to uh, number two here, please, sir. Thanks for the talk. Um, the previous slide on the red and blue pill, um, can you elaborate a little bit on how you as a researcher and user of augmented reality um, eventually better understand reality? So you mean when we use augmented reality, that might lead to a little, uh, to a little better understanding of what, what reality is, or, or what did you mean? <laughs> yes, yes, that's the question. Do you feel like you're not just using, but also researching? Because in order to, for example, when you have the slide on how the 3D scan works, you use it as, let's say, um, a metaphor or a shortcut on how our own brain and visual system works, or how yeah. does... <laughs> well, like I said, it's a, a rather metaphysical question, so um, it's hard to really answer the question right now. It's more like uh, you could um, guess what it might, uh, how it might change for people, what their perception of reality, um, how does that change? But I don't, I, I can't really answer that to be honest. Like it's, it's, it's more of an open question for myself as well, because like 
when I think about augmented reality and, and if it eventually will be used by, by everybody every day, um, like I can think of some some um, like dystopian sci-fi scenarios where, where everyone lives in this uh, happy world, which is totally fake, um, um, and the real world basically uh, looks awful. But nobody actually noticed that because everyone is like uh, caged in, in his own own happy place, for example. So, but I don't know if that's going to happen. It's just a possible danger that that you could think of. But. Uh, this is probably something that will not happen in the next 20 to 30 years because we, we simply don't have the technology to do that right now. So maybe that more or less answers your question, I hope. Yeah, next one. Yeah, the next one. I was thinking along as well. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so to get widespread consumer adoption, we really need the miniaturization of the hardware. Uh, Google Glass got kind of laughed out of the room a few years ago, so we need to be better than that. Yeah, but Google Glass wasn't really augmented reality. Um, it was like more like a heads-up display because you had this tiny screen um, and, and the back of uh, like the, the right uh, upper uh, part of, of your vision, field of vision, and um, it was like you could just display a limited amount of information there. Like when you have real augmented reality, is basically um, having the whole space to put information. Sure, uh, I mean more like it's a stupid looking thing to walk around on your head. So we've got to look better than that when we're yeah, yeah, the that's, mass that's, consumer that's right. adoption. But that's, so. that's why I think that, that we have to go to like where, where medical glasses are right now, because they are already accepted in society. So someone wearing glasses uh, doesn't get looked at in a funny way, because it's pretty normal. So if augmented reality headsets look more or less the same, I think we're fine. So, so the question is, what are the technological problems that we have to solve to get there in a consumer device? Yeah, we have to actually miniaturize the stuff. So I think the laser projectors actually are an interesting solution because they are rather small and you can project directly into the eyes of the users. So if we get like this user bias uh, figured out, how we can uh, like actually um, convince people that this is a good idea, not dangerous at all, uh, we can shrink it down even further. And if we have the, the whole processing, um, not on the device itself, but on third party, um, like data centers or something like that. We can also shrink that down, so we have to actually only stream uh, the input uh, to the server, and we have to stream like the, the image back to the device. And then we can build pretty small devices, I think. So that's what we have to figure out. But yeah, it's, it's, I, I think this is something that's actually going to happen, um, I don't know, in the next five years or something like that, because this is actually something that, that's worked on right now. Microsoft actually is building the next version of HoloLens, which should be smaller, which should have more features like eye tracking and stuff like that. Um, but we have to wait and see, basically. Like this, is, this is also, uh, I think, an important thing. Um, the hardware involved is, is very complex. Um, so it's not something that, that one person can do in his garage or something like that. So you pretty much only have the chance to have those big corporations do the stuff and do the research because it's so complex. Yeah. With a little bit of imagination, we see someone stepping in there from the internet who has a question, holographically projected here next to me on stage. Can you... Uh... Hi. The internet has a related question. How long do you think will it take until everyone uses augmented reality like mobile phones today? Oh, uh, I think that really depends um, on, on the use cases. I think this is the most important thing for acceptance. You have to provide functionality that actually benefits the, the way um, people live their lives. For example, the, the AR translation, I think, is a good example because it's common for people to, when they are traveling, for example, um, to, to run to signs or something like that, um, which they can't understand because it's a foreign language. And if you provide an augmented reality solution for this particular problem, people are going to use it because it's practical, because it's useful. And the more functionality, it's the same with smartphones, really. The more functionality you provide um, that goes in this direction, the easier uh, the adaption will be. So, yeah, that's basically, we have to find uh, use cases which are important to people, and then the adaption will basically happen uh, itself. Critical mass, probably. Will yeah, critical mass, yeah. Uh, number three, please, uh, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, when you introduce the platforms, what is with Facebook with the Oculus Rift? Mm. Is, it, is it not uh, Oculus? Is it not virtual reality? 
Yeah, it's virtual reality. It's not really augmented reality. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about including it, but I, I still don't have any idea where they are going with this. So they have bu uh, bought this company. They have uh, invested in this technology. But yeah, I don't, I don't see where they are going with this right now, what, what their goal is actually. So this is why I didn't include it. Mm, thank you. Yeah, we will come in your direction anyhow. But number two, please. Um, f first of all, thank you for the informative talk. And what do you think will change from privacy policy with when you have an active live feed of what you're seeing with the augmented reality? Yeah, <laughs> I think like this may be the, the cynical way of looking at it, but I think uh, people will stop caring about that. That is what simply is going to happen. Like we, like the, the current generation is concerned with privacy and we, we feel like um, for us, it's a, it's a very bad idea to actually have a constant live feed of what we are seeing transmitted to somewhere on the internet. But if I, like, I, I see that with younger people who use smartphones. They don't think about privacy pretty much. They think about what this device can you, do for them. Um, and I think this is like more or less the social change. Uh, maybe that will happen. People will stop caring about it. This, it will just be a normal thing that, that your, your field of vision gets transmitted to somewhere on the internet and, and people will simply stop care. I think that is what's go this is what's going to happen, yeah. Thank you. Okay, the next step, number two. Uh, thanks. Um, I saw uh, recently there was a company that announced some, uh, some shades and they had a bone conducting uh, sound transmission. So they didn't really project something into the retina, so they uh, went away uh, around uh, all the projection and all the complexity of making this huge bulky headset. Um, do you think this is a viable way to go forward? You've focused mostly on visual inputs, but maybe other sensors are better suited to making an entry into a, a, a augmented reality. What do you think about that? Yes. An interesting point. Um, yeah. I focus a lot on the visual side of things, but um, the important thing, um, I guess, with all this mixed reality and virtual reality stuff is that it's not limited to the visual. So basically it should be a, a whole uh, sensory uh, um, experience, so all your senses are involved. So yeah, maybe that's a good idea to not only focus on the, on the visuals uh, so much, but also maybe on things like audio, like you said. Um, I don't... Like, it's, it's really the same question with the use cases. When you, when you figure out a, a very good use case where like an audio augmentation helps people in their everyday life, I think people will start to use it. Um, but the way, or the reason why I, I focus mostly on the visual part is um, because I think it, it's the most uh, strongest sensory um, experience people usually have when they have eyesight at least. Um, and I think this is most likely also to be like the selling point of augmented reality will most likely be the visual part, yeah. Okay, another one, number two. Thanks uh, for the talk. Um, you mentioned that um, one of the ways you see um, the miniaturization of these uh, devices evolving is by streaming data into the cloud. Um, but we, we've seen, I mean, especially with with smartphones these days having you know the equivalent computational power of you know computers from a decade ago that it is actually possible to do a lot of these you know machine vision um, tasks on a, on a smartphone and I think some manufacturers are you know like basically trying to get your smartphone to be your primary computer so do you see do you see that as a likely alternative because you know obviously this comes back to the privacy question because if you can keep things local then yeah, but it, it also comes best to what, what the, the um, producers of the devices um, want, want, yeah, want you to, to actually do with the devices. So, um, yeah, of course, if you have, like, when you have miniaturization, it's powerful enough to put it, like, a whole computer into something like normal glasses. Um, you could do that, and you don't have to stream um, that much information. But I guess what you, you still have to actually do all this stuff because, um, you are not alone in, in the world, basically, with augmented reality. So if everyone else is using augmented reality, you need to, to have that actual data from what the others are doing. Like, you have to build, for example, in this, in this building, I have to build a constant room model of how this building looks like. So everyone who is moving uh, through this building will constantly scan the environment to, to build um, the 3D model of the environment. But you would 
uh, you have to share that information so that when I move into this building for the first time, I still have the whole environment mapped out because someone else already walked through it. So you still have to stream all that and you still have yeah, you still have to share all those data. So I think even if you increase the processing power of the devices itself, um, this is not going to change much. Thanks. Okay, sir. Okay, my question is very much related. Um, with all the big players designing the devices, it's still a closed world. And I ha would have to imagine I would have to stream my live feed um, to some Microsoft server or whatever. Uh, are there any efforts uh, to keep at least interfaces open, open, if not the whole software open source? So, for example, the CCC could put up a server I trust and send my, my live feed to. To get yeah, if, if the sub system is open or not, that you can actually change the location where your information is transmitted to. Yeah, well, at least I don't know of, of any open hardware, open software pro projects who try to do augmented reality right now. Of course, there's research. Um, research is more or less open most of the time, but research prototypes right now, while they are good at what they do, they are hardly like um, consumer products. So you can't really mass produce them and distribute them to the people. Um, so yeah, you, you probably could do it, but I don't see, currently, I don't see any movement in this regard. Yeah. I shouldn't do that, but just for the previous question, I would suggest... Um, Speak up, please. Oh, I shouldn't do that, but to answer briefly the previous question, Web AR uh, and some effort from Mozilla are trying to bring at least the highest level of the stack uh, in an open source fashion for augmented reality, so okay. something to check. Um, yeah, I was wondering for the example you showed on your uh, research in your own lab about uh, information retrieval, um, those examples that are able to distinguish between one object and another, let's say an apple and a pear or a tomato works well, but I'm wondering how scalable it is because when you get to yep. a more precise example, it's... Yeah, that's, 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 that's a good point because like what we were using was an actual food database for that, so it was very easy to classify like the vegetables because they are food. Uh, but if you have a database with everything in it, uh, of course it's a problem because like classification will get you some weir weird results. So maybe I, uh, the vegetable would be recognized, I don't know, as a lamp or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's a problem. Um, but this is only a problem like in this particular uh, research case. It was more like a proof of concept to actually show, okay, how can we use uh, augmented reality in some more practical everyday scenarios. It wasn't really much focused on uh, to find a perfect uh, technical solution for pro providing like the classification of the images. This is also why we use an existing uh, service for that and we didn't build our own. So we just use what, what was available. Yeah. Okay, unless someone is beaming himself up from the internet, then we had all the questions here answered. Thank you very, very much, uh, Patrick. Yeah, thank you. I hope to see you soon. Thank you.